Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second weekly installment of the KCARD uh, Fall Grant Workshop, Growing Your Farm and Food Business. Uh, we'll be here to discuss financials this week, but before we do that, I just want to do a brief introduction uh, to KCARD and the services we offer. So we're the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development. Um, we offer uh, services related to business planning, uh, financial planning, market plan, marketing planning, uh, feasibility studies, uh, kind of just general intake questions as well, since we're very well connected with the, the ag ecosystem in the state, we're able to direct you to the service providers who can help you if we're not the appropriate ones. Um, and, and so a lot of people kind of ask when they should contact KCARD, like if they're ready to launch their business or if they've already launched. And the correct answer is really anytime. So you can do pre-launch, you can do idea phase even. Uh, we'll be happy to discuss and you know feasibility of your venture with you. We'll be happy to assist you in finding funding. And that's really at any stage, whether you're just beginning, uh, whether you started your business and you're in your first year or whether you've been in business 50 years and you're just looking for some uh, to revamp or looking for some advice on it. Um, so we have a staff that's uh, kind of spread out all across the state and while we're currently somewhat restricted in our travel capacity and can certainly meet you via Zoom like this. Uh, we always prefer to meet in person when possible. Um, and we, we travel and cover the entire state from east to west. Uh, in my role at KCARD, specifically I'm the grant facilitator. So I will help you uh, find funding that's appropriate for where you're currently at. Often that involves having a call with you to just discuss your funding needs, uh, both the amount uh, and the scope of, of kind of your plans and project, understanding that no one grant will really cover all of your plans or projects in one foul swoop, but we can often piece together bits and pieces of uh, various grants to make a patchwork uh, that, that is the makeup of your funding uh, package. So with that, um, Brent, if I missed anything, please feel free to introduce yourself. Um, this week I've got with me Brent Lackey with the Kentucky Center for Angular Development. He is our uh, senior business development specialist um, and not because of his age, but because of his experience. And we're happy to have him join this weekend, uh, this week with us. Uh, so Brent, if you'd like to discuss your role and, and anything that I missed in the overview. Thanks James. It's, you know. Appreciate the opportunity to speak this morning and represent KCARD in this workshop. As James mentioned, my name is Brent Lackey. I'm the Senior Business Development Specialist at KCARD. Um, my primary job duties are to provide business advisory services um, to ag businesses and farmers such as you across the state, whether it's business planning, financial analysis, helping with financial projections, or just doing break-even analysis to figure out where you are and where you need to be to, get, reach, your, to reach your goals. Um, also do management consultations. I, mean, I think if you really sum it up, one of the really one of the main objectives of KCARD is how can we help fulfill the goals and dreams of those organizations and farmers that we're working for, you know, how we can best get you there. And sometimes it's giving you the bad news that, you know what, this dream might not work, but there might be an alternative dream that gets you where you want to get to. So, um, and also I work with other staff and kind of helping them mentor them and work on professional development activities as well. Um, glad to be here today and um, hopefully I won't bore you too much later on when I'm speaking. So, Brent, One of the things I failed to mention that you can just speak briefly on is I know we're the Cooperative Development Center in Kentucky and we offer services related to consultation on folks who may be interested in starting cooperatives. Yes, um, we receive, we are the only co only cooperative development center recognized by USDA in the state of Kentucky. Uh, we have been a co-op development center since our um, inception in 2000, in 2000 for over 20 years now. We've worked with over 50 cooperatives either to get started or with existing co-ops in improving their operations. Um, if you have any questions about the cooperative, the cooperative structure, or you've got a group of people who are truly have a, a shared need and goal and would like to start a co-op to, to, to fulfill that, we can help you through that process. And we, we're well versed in that cooperative development process. Absolutely. So uh, just some, some housekeeping before we get started with the slides. This week, much like last week, uh, the Q&A will be open at the bottom of your screen. The chat will not be available, so you won't see a chat. But if you have a question, please pop it into Q&A and we'll answer it as it's appropriate. Um, if it's 
pertinent to what we're talking about, I may interject or, or interrupt Brent. He may do the same for me. Um, or we'll also have just a general Q&A session at the end that we'll be sure to move through all those questions at. So know that we're looking at it. Uh, we're not ignoring it. It will be answered in, in one way or another at one point or another throughout the webinar. Uh, and we thank you for joining us today. Let's see, I will go ahead and pull up the slideshow and get us rolling on that then. And as promised, the topic this week uh, is understanding your financials. And as you can see, uh, we've got a little quote there, you cannot manage what you do not measure. It's, it's true not only in finance, but in pretty much everything in your production you can't measure your yield or you can't yet yeah, manage your yield if you haven't measured it to understand it first. So in the same way, understanding your financials is a lot of first collecting that data and then being able to analyze it into something more useful. And I know often the topic of financials are kind of a gray area. Um, either people don't want to discuss or share. Um, and oftentimes they don't really know what their true financial position is. And we're not here to judge. We're not here to kick the tires. Um, we're just here, you know, to pop the hood, take a look at the engine and, and we kind of know where to beat to see if things are sounding right. So, all right, so we've got why financials are important from the grant perspective. And this is kind of from my side. So understanding your financials, it'll help you make decisions regarding your funding needs, mainly in the dollar amount you're looking for in the time frame. So if you're a beginning farmer and rancher, we're gonna tailor your resources uh, that I send your way quite differently than we would and establish businesses, an established business that has a quarter million dollars in, you know, semi-annual revenue and has been around for, you know, 40 years. So your funding need both in the size of the package you'll need um, and in kind of what it actually covers will be very different uh, just depending on where you're at in your business's life cycle. And we can help you at any point along the way, but it's just sometimes when you just go generally looking for grants um, and cast your net out there to see what's out there, you can pull back uh, a lot of things that just aren't relevant to you and they can be enticing because they have a high dollar amount or perhaps they cover something you need, but they might not be, you know, they, they might be smaller grants that aren't enough for what you need if you're that larger business, or they might be large grants that really don't cover what you, what you're looking for. So you kind of have to know before you even go into this process of granting, you know, where you're at financially, um, what your plans are for the next one to three years um, and, and plans for growth and what you plan on investing in. Because that's ultimately what a grant is. It's an investment. Um, oftentimes it's not a 100% um, full on grant. A lot of times it may be a cost share uh, or a reimbursement based grant that you have to put up cash match. So you're investing, even if it, even if you're getting, you know, 50 cents on the dollar back or 67 cents on the dollar back, it's still an investment that you're making both in your time and your money. Uh, and you wanna be prudent about that. So that being said, we'll, we'll help to kind of gauge your interests and your needs um, and your size and kind of filter opportunities that best fit you uh, towards you and then help you through that process. But knowing your financials, um, it'll also just in turn, uh, give you a better understanding of your business, which will help you communicate, you know, that business's needs in the grant applications. Because oftentimes what grantors are looking for, whether it's the federal government, whether it's a private foundation, or whether it's a state agency, they're looking to make sure that they're making a prudent investment and they're looking to make sure that you know what you're doing, that you're not starting out with something that you have no experience in um, or that you're, you know, taking on a project that perhaps is too much or too little and doesn't make sense for you. Um, so understanding your financials and, and where your business is at and where the cash comes in and where it goes out, you know, your income and your expenses will ultimately help communicate kind of your business in general, what it is um, and your business model to potential funders, not only banks, but also grantors. Um, and it'll enable you to create, you know, financial projections, which any, any loan you apply for, you know, will often require pro forma financial statements, these financial projections. And it's a lot easier to create those if you've got, you know, good record keeping practices and you've got a few periods worth of, of data to be able to project and extrapolate out rather than just starting 
with nothing when the bank asks you and then trying to kind of pull pull some disparate data together from old receipts and such to figure out what your you know income and expenses are. Um, and let's see, in terms of with grants, there are some grants um, that do actually require financial projections. Um, some of the larger federal grants that we'll discuss two weeks from now uh, often require the same pro forma financials that perhaps a lender would in terms of they wanna be able to see that the investment of this grant will get you to a point where you are at greater profitability uh, than you currently were in your baseline year or in your current year. And um, on the tail end of that, it'll help ease the burden of the required reporting because if you have good record keeping uh, systems in place, both financially and otherwise, it will help you to not spend so much time when it comes time to report, you know, your quarterly revenue or your annual revenue on your grant so that you can report the increase in revenue. Because a lot of grants are focused on, like I just mentioned, increasing, you know, your income and financial position. So they want to know in your baseline year, if you made this, how are you doing this year and how are you doing at this point in this grant compared to that? So if you've got those records readily available, it's pretty easy to just pull up and run a, you know, a QuickBooks inquiry or even look at your Excel sheet and say, okay, here's, you know, here's how much I've had. I can just enter this number directly into this federal form and it makes the record keeping quite a bit easier. So kind of that demonstrates how financials are important at every step during the grant process. You know, even when you're just beginning to search for grants, um, when you're in the application process, and even when you're in the award phase, how it can help. And now I'll let Brent speak as to why they are uh, important from the business and farm perspective. All right, thanks, James. And one quick thing I would add is it's not just federal grants, you know, even the, if the state with Agdo and board, they're looking for cash flow projections for any, um, any business opportunity they're looking to fund as well. So, um, but, you know, but, you know, but, you know, financials are, you know, financial management is a crucial part of any business operation and business management. You know, without your financial or financial records and reports that, you know, it makes it really hard for you to monitor the performance of your business and farm. You know, all farmers are really good, you know, are, are really good at keeping up with, they generally know what their, what their yield is per acre on that number of bushels of corn, you know, but what was their what was their performance of the farm as far as profit per acre and then those things are just as important or more important to the you know to the operation because sometimes if you if it costs you more you know sometimes if it takes you you know a cost to serve model if it takes you a lot more money to get that extra yield then maybe you're better off with a different type of genetic or something else or a different customer that maybe doesn't pay as well but they're easier to serve so really monitoring your performance of your business and make those and then also what that leads you into is helping you make informed decisions. And one of the things that KCART has always tried to stress is that it's not our role to help you make a decision. It is our role that we, we feel like if we can help you make an informed decision, you know, sometimes we've had clients make decisions that we disagree with, but sometimes it's turned out for them. But you know, but financials really help you or really give you another understanding of your business to make that informed decision. Um, also, if you if financials are important, if you've got goals or aspirations for your farm or business, those business that that helps you understand the resources, the financials help you understand the resources that are needed to achieve those goals. How much money is it going to cost in labor or how much money is it going to cost in capital expenses? What how much working capital do I need to really achieve that? Um, also, um, financials are important because it can help protect your farm or business from from risk. You know, it helps you from a risk management standpoint of understanding what's right and make, you know, going back to that making informed decisions. It can help protect your farm from going down a, an avenue that puts your farm at risk or at liability. As James mentioned, they're vital for securing funding, whether it's grants or loans. Financial. Uh, generally speaking, that, lo that loan officer is going to a want to look at past financials to say, okay, what am I dealing with? You know, as well as your projections. You know, if your projections don't match kind of what your past financials are, there's something in question. They're going to want to figure out what's there. And then finally, going back to protecting your farm or business, it kind of helps identify potential areas of risk. You know, what are some concerns? What are things that you need to be watching out for to make sure that you're um, limiting that liability for your farm and moving it to mo most likely success. Next slide, James. Um, 
one of the things that we talk about is, you know, not only we like to focus on projections and getting better, but we also, you know, it's really important to understand your past and knowing your past really provides a history for forecasting the future. Um, we generally recommend that you have at least three years of records to really be able to provide that solid base when you're looking at applying for a loan or applying for a grant to, to secure that funding. Now, if it's a brand new entity, we understand three years is not, it's not possible, but having those three years of records is, is vitally important. You know, in some cases, large, longer records is needed from, you know, have to think about your taxes as well and how long your CPA or accountant recommends you keep tax, you know, certain records for your taxes. You know, in financial records that you need to look at is what's, what's your sales records, what's my cost, you know, receipts and, and, and those types of things, um, overhead. Also, really having good farm production records, you know, what, you know, when I, what, what, what was the variety of corn I planted in this field and what did it yield and what, what type of production expenses did I have for, for that? And then finally, market channels and things of that nature. Next slide, James. Yeah, I just like to add to that, um, kind of on the three years of, of financial records, everybody tends to come to us and say, wow, three years, how do you, you know, how do I come up with that? And the answer really is start three years ago. That's the best time to start record keeping would be three years ago. The second best time is today. And that's how you get to the three year point is just by starting and, and keeping those records. Cause you never need them until you go to the bank, you know, or until you, that grantor asks for them, but they're extremely helpful once that time comes. Thanks, James. You know, and, and as James just put, now is the time to start keeping better records. If you don't have good records, now is the time. You know, it really helps you understand how your cash flow throughout through, through the business year, where your cycles are. It helps you get prepared to buy that new tractor or whatever, you know, grant you want to pursue. Those records, now, you know, start now. If you don't have good records, start now. You know, and next slide, you know, and the records that you need to be thinking about keeping are sales records, you know, keeping track of invoices, keeping track of delivery records, you know, those sell you know, in, in delivery receipts. If you're, if you're wholesaling product and you're delivering product and not, you know, lots of times you don't get paid the day you deliver, well, guess what? That signed delivery receipt is going to be really important if there's ever a dispute about whether or not how much they should pay you or not. I know in back, I think back to my experience when I previous before KCART, I was I managed a cooperative in marketing vegetables. And there was many times that sign bill lading helped me get through a dispute over or not, you know, the person owed me or not. Um, keep track of bills, keep track, you know, keep track of those and, and, and organize them, not just in a shoebox, which is the classic example, but try to have some type of filing system where they're organized and tracked by vendor or by the type of account, you know, whether it's utilities or something, something nature. Um, bank statements, you know, this is a must keep, you know, keep those in some type of organization, whether it's in a file or a three ring binder somewhere, inventory records, um, you know, timesheets. If you've got personnel, if you've got labor, you want to make sure that you're keeping track of that time, whether it's a signed timesheet or some type of time card that they punch in. So you really, so there's no dispute about whether or not how much you owe them, your employee, and B, it can help you go back and figure out, okay, um, how, you know, when, I, when I'm, okay, I, I want to go from X to Y as far as production, and it helps you figure out your labor, how much more labor you're going to need to go there by looking at those timesheets. Um, personnel records, legal loan documents, equipment manuals, I mean, I'm, most farmers know this, but how many times do you have to pull out that equipment manual to work on something? I mean, just on my lawnmower here at home, I, I pull it out six, seven times a year just to think about service and stuff like that. And then y'all will know spray records and things of this nature are very important to keep. So, so from a farm perspective, or you know, especially from a farmer, there's a lot of records to keep. So it's important to have that organizational system. Next slide, James. So you know, you want to have some type of dedicated place for your records, um, you know, whether it be in an office in your home, an office in your, and just have an office out in the shed, but somewhere where you've got a dedicated place for those records and in a system that makes sense to you. You know, it doesn't have, you know, my system is gonna be different from your system, but having some type of system that makes sense and that if something happens to you that if that you're husband or wife needs to look at or your partner needs to look at them, they can under, they understand your system and know where they are. 
that system also helps create efficiencies when some, you need to look up that spray record or you need to look find that um, manual for your sprayer or your or your tractor you know where exactly where to go or if you need that legal document you know this is in this file here you know also if i need to find a you know, record for this bill i know it was kept in this folder having that type of system whether it's in a you know it can be a file folders it could be a, a series of you know plastic tubs where this plastic tub keeps this but something that's organized and that you understand and also it's really also good to make sure you're organized your records you know that are financially related or organized by year you know you, you want you don't want to make you know a tax you know preparing taxes and looking at your records making sure that you've got here's my 2020 receipts 2019 stay here you know and have place and having a place to store them in case you need them three years ago and stuff like that next slide james absolutely and i was going to ask brent i know here at kcard we have a lot of redundancy in our document storage in terms of we keep the physical copy uh, and we store it typically online. We scan it in and put it somewhere just in case the physical copy is ever lost to a natural disaster or whatever. Do we suggest that kind of for clients in general? I think it's, it is good to have a backup of a file. I mean, generally speaking, James, I'm just hoping for a record, a record in general. But if we, you do want to have some type of backup in place, you know, if you're primarily keeping stuff on your computer, then you want to be able on your computer and then maybe all, you know, an external hard drive where you store stuff as well, or uh, the physical copy. I mean, I do think it's important to have a backup of your record, whether it be um, two versions of your digital copy or two, a digital and a physical copy. A, a backup is always justified, so. Good deal. It's coming. There we go. Um, and then as far as systems for financial records, there's a wide variety of things to do. You know, if, if we've worked with clients who use all of these different types of systems, from a manual ledger to an Excel spreadsheet to QuickBooks to point of sale systems, it, they get very complex. And you need to find a system. All of those systems can work for you. You just have to find a system that works for your preference and for your business and your level of expertise in handling those. I mean, I've worked with clients who, some of the clients that I've had that had some of the best set of records were generally man, were manual ledgers, where they but they kept up with every, you know, had a physical piece of paper and they kept with them. Now it's harder to compile, it's not as easy to analyze, but those records were well kept. Um, and if that's, if you're more of a pencil paper person, that's fine, no, not a problem with that. Um, but, you know, there's also, but just be, and also don't think just because you buy QuickBooks, you're all of a sudden an accountant. Because with systems like QuickBooks or with your spreadsheets, your, your record keeping is only as good as the information that you, you put in there. And you wanna make sure that how you set up your spreadsheet to track your records is makes, matches your records. With QuickBooks, QuickBooks likes to kind of have these default expenses and default stuff and things will go there if you're not careful you want to make sure that your chart of accounts is set up if you use QuickBooks to match your business and to make sure that things are going in those right places so you can truly understand it. QuickBooks is a wonderful tool and I'd recommend it for people who are comfortable using computers, but you want to make sure that just because you, it's not just, you can't just plug and play and go with it. You've got to put some time to make sure it's set up correctly. And the same way with point of sale systems. If you've never tracked inventory before, a point of sale systems could overwhelm you, you know, but if you're used to tracking inventory, Oh my gosh, the, how much lot easier your life is as a result of it. But you, like I said, you have to find a system that fits your level of techno, technical skills and what's best for your business. You know, any of these can work. You just got to match them up with your, what's best for you. Next slide, James. Brent, I wanted to ask, how often should you reconcile these systems? Because you mentioned a very valid point. You know, you want to look at, you know, your spreadsheet or QuickBooks and make sure that, you know, these uh, expenditures are going in the appropriate accounts. And I know, a lot of people, a popular answer would be, well, tax time is when you reconcile it, but you know, things can get hairy then and by that time you've got a lot of data that's been telling you perhaps the wrong thing for the previous 12 months. So how often to not be burdensome, but to stay on top of it, would you recommend like checking in on your QuickBooks and making sure your accounts are, are all in order? I would reconcile them monthly. You know, you know, you get monthly bank statements, you get monthly credit card statements of that nature. So to my, my feeling is, 
you find a time on a monthly basis and reconcile that on that monthly basis. And in fact, I generally recommend, to me, that's a, a, a way to really test the integrity of your financial reports that we're going to talk about later is, have they been reconciled? You know, and, and that gives you some feeling. You know, we, we generally recommend, I generally recommend that I don't want, when I ask for a financial report, I don't want it you to print one as of today, if it hasn't been reconciled, I, I would just prefer to be through the last reconciliation period. And that way, and that way, every month when you're looking at financial reports, you're looking at the same data and the same, you're comparing apples to apples. Yeah. And when you think, when you're talking about financial statements and people are saying, well, sure, what's your financial, you know, I mean, one of the first, Maybe not the first meeting with KCARD, but pretty soon, early on in KCARD, one of the questions is going to be asked, can you give us a copy of your financials? And you know, you might know what, you, what exactly you're talking about. Well, there's a variety of financial statements that we could be referring to. And any of these is, is helpful to your business. One is a budget, which is basically where you sit down and you figure out, okay, how much do I plan on spending on, on these activities, you know, on these different, you know, I'm going to grow X acres of tomatoes. So my, I, my expected yield is this at this price. So I'm going to earn this. My expected expenses are labor is going to cost me about this. I'm going to have about this many hours in labor. I'm going to have to spend so much in plants and so much in fertilizer and so, those things. And it, that gives you a ballpark of what you expect to earn per your acres of tomatoes. And then you can then, what's really important is to come back and track that and look and see how you, what you actually did. And that way you can adjust your budget moving forward. Um, the income statement is a, you know, kind of what, what it does is it marries, measures your business's performance over a period of time, whether it's it be monthly, quarterly, yearly. And you know, what it does is kind of measures, you know, the earned income you've made in that period versus the expenses that you've earned, you know, during that time period and your cost. Um, you can do, you know, for generally speaking, most ag businesses deal with a cash system where it's, you record the expense or the income when you've actually put the money in the bank. Um, there are, the accrual system is when you, when you earn the income is when you record it or when that expense is incurred, it is not when you actually pay the bill or get paid for it. So that's the difference between cash and accrual. Um, some key items in your um, income statement is you have your sales income at the top and you have your cost of goods sold, which measures your cost for producing that product. And you have your operating expenses and it shows your bottom line. You know, a, a lot of farmers and a lot of business people, they really like, they, they really could, they do a good job keeping track of sales. You know, I've got a, a really good client who's like, he tells me, well, Brent, we're, so, we're up so far. So, you know, and it's always about sales. And so that's great. But where are you on the bottom line? How's that tracking? You know, and so that gives you an idea. Um, another, you know, key financial statement would be the balance sheet. And the balance sheet kind of measures your, the health of your business or farm at that point of time. You know, on October 16th, 2020, my balance sheet shows you, shows my health of my business. How will I, how, what's, how much of, you know, and it shows what my assets are, what my debts are, and then how much of those assets I actually own versus the bank owning, you know, and it shows my ability to cover over my, all my debts and to, cover, and to cover all my current liabilities. And it's my strength of my business. And then you look at it over time to see is my, is the financial health of my business growing or is it declining, you know, as, as I'm going forward. And then finally, um, a good financial statement is your cash flow statement which basically measures all the only and all cash transactions are included. You know, one thing on the income statement, you, when you have loan payments, only your, only your interest is recorded, not the whole principal payment. So, but you also get to have depreciation on your income statement. Well, obviously that's not a cash expense. With a cash statement, you have the whole loan payment, the whole principal and interest, but you don't have interest. And what that cash flow really kind of shows you you know, cash is very important in operating a farm or business and, and measures your ability to continue operating your liquidity. It really shows, all right, I'm generating this much cash from this business. I'm not just generating equity, I'm actually generating cash. Next statement, James. Slide, James. Um, here's just an example of what a budget might look like. Like I said, you have your income items in your top level, enterprise one, two, 
and your budgeted amount, what you think you're going to earn, then it's always good to come back with actual amount and show difference. You know, and, and you know, if obviously you, whether in agriculture, we are weather dependent, you know, if we have, you know, it's always good to make notes of your, you know, hey, we, we went through a drought or we had a major storm on this day that blew down some corn or we had disease issues as a result of this effort. I and mean, then also your expense items on the left, so feed, seed, advertising, what you expect to expend on those, the actual, come back and measure the actual amount and then show the difference in any notes, you know. My, oh, my feed expense was really high this year because we weren't able to produce as much on the farm as we were hoping to or, um, you know, or we had a worldwide pandemic and feed costs went, and, you know, and all of a sudden this cost went up, you know things happen so but keep track of those because there are some years that are outliers and you want to make sure that there's you know that those are outliers and that's another reason to keep three to five years worth of records because over time it, it shows trends whereas that one year kind of give one year can be an outlier so next slide james um again as we mentioned you know the income statement it measures your revenue expenses over a period of time it's not the same as the cash flow. You don't include loans, you don't include grants. Um, it does not include principal payments or distributions, um, but it does include depreciation expense. Um, next slide, James. Um, you know, kind of a simplified version of an income statement because in this format, you have your, your sales at the top, and then you and then you want to sort of track that your cost of goods sold, which again is the items that that are important to the cost you incur to produce that product. Um, and then that gives you your sales minus your cost of goods sold or COGS as it's often referred to as, it gives you your gross profit. And that tells you how profitable you are from the actual physical operations of your farm or business. And then you have operating expenses such as utilities, um, insurance, advertising, website expenses, office expenses. And then you subtract that those and that gives you your net income. Next slide, James. Um, your income statement, you, you can have various alternative uh, uh, formats to what's how you want to do it. You can have a year to date. You can have um, an actual versus a budget format for your income statement. You can say what our year to date is and what we expected it to be. It can be an actual versus a year ago. And that's something that I often like to look at is to look at in QuickBooks allows you to do is to say, here's my performance this year. This is how it compared to last year's performance. The one thing you want to make sure that you do in whatever format you do, you do look at. And like I said, I often like to look through like, when I look at year to date, I'll, I prefer like to the last ending month to date or whenever that reconciliation period is because I want to be able to compare apples to apples. You know, if I'm looking at October, it's October 16th versus October 16th last year, where there might've been an expense that sometimes gets paid on the 17th and something got paid on the 15th last year. But if I look through September of every year, that's gonna cover everything, you know, and, that, and everything's been reconciled. Also, you wanna maintain that consistency so you can look at those reports correctly. And so you can truly compare apples to apples and you're not, you use a different format every time you look, you produce an income statement you're looking at it differently and you might be making different decisions. Next slide, James. Um, we've referred to co cost of goods sold a couple of times, but you know, we wanted to make sure to take a point of really diving in for a second on this is, because oftentimes you hear people, well, what's your COGS, what is this? You know, and that's COGS refers to cost of goods sold. And what those are is your direct cost of producing your product, whether it's what, whatever widget it is or farm product you've got. Know, if it you know it's truly that cost of you producing that product from a uh, of a crop you know if you're if you're producing tomatoes the cost of your plants the cost of your fertilizer obviously those are costs that you have that directly relate to that packaging the, the boxes that you put it in is a direct cost um raw you know and, and they include raw materials plant you know labor to produce electricity for the production you know if if, if you don't if you've got a a packing line and you never turn on that the lights until it's time to pack tomatoes well guess what that electricity is a direct result of your is a direct cost for you so that's kind of what cogs are if you've got more questions about that but what that does is it really helps you measure you know 
you know, and why you want to measure COGS versus you know, separate from other expenses, it lets you know, is my sales revenue covering my direct cost? You know, we've had, because if it's not, then you need to figure out a way to be more efficient or this is an enterprise you need to go, some, you, need, you need to scrap. I often joke, we had a client once who told us that we, we did some analysis for them and we showed them that they were, it was, they were selling some product for $2.25 a pound and their COGS was $2.27 a pound. Their answer was to increase their volume. Well, guess what? They lost more money because they increased their volume because the cost, your cost is going to continue to rise. There wasn't fixed expenses in there. So next slide. Um, this kind of goes along with your COGS. You know, COGS can really kind of understand your crop cost. You know, when I'm looking at planning a crop, how many transplants or how many plants per acre do I need, you know, for that, for that um, spot I'm going to use? Um, how much seed cost is there? What's the unit? What's the cost per unit? So my total cost, and that's going to be this. Harvest, you know, harvesting can be, is an expensive time if it's a, something such as, you know, tomatoes. A lot, there's a lot of labor that goes in harvesting tomatoes or other crops. How many hours do you expect to, it takes to harvest those? What are you going to be paying per hour for your labor to get that harvest cost? Or if you're in a a grain crop, harvest is expensive because you're you know how much how much fuel and depreciation and equipment am I going to have to use to harvest that acre of corn or acre of soybeans? And then packaging and delivery is an important crop cost, especially if you're direct marketing of vegetables. And you know how much is that box going to cost? Uh, sometimes that's an overlooked thing. How much does that box cost? How much is that, you know, or by putting my if I'm not put them on pallets, how much does that pallet cost? How much does it cost me to palletize that to shrink wrap it? It might just be a few pennies, but guess what? Those few pennies add up. And you want to make sure you're tracking those. Go ahead, James. And then in their indirect costs, which are kind of your operating expenses. You know, those are depreciation, repair and maintenance. Oh my gosh, repair and maintenance is something that can eat you if you're not careful and really tracking that. Your insurance costs, your property taxes. These are things that you really need to be thinking about and you really need to figure out, okay, my expected yield is this. So this is kind of what my cost per unit on those is gonna be. But you, you know, at the same time, if, if your yield isn't that, that cost is still gonna be there. So, you know, this is a way of, more yield you have, the better off you are covering these expenses, your indirect costs. Um, next slide. Um, the final statement was what I'd call the cash flow statement, which is measuring your only, your cash transactions are included. You have kind of your cash inflow or, or sources of cash, minus your cash outflow or uses of cash equals your net cash flow. Um, you want to always start out with your opening balance plus your cash sources minus your cash outflow gives you your close closing balance. Um, there are some items that are listed on a cash flow statement that are not on an income statement. We mentioned those earlier, but we'll go over those again to make sure you get them away. Your loan payments or a receiving a loan. If you receive a loan, it's going to show up on your on this. If you get a grant, it's going to show up as a, as a source of cash. If if you invest more money in your business or farm. That's a source of cash that would not show necessarily an income statement. Uses would be, you know, your loan payments um, would be something. If you draw, if you're an owner and you draw money out of the business to cover some of your own personal expenses, that's not a farm expense. That would show up on your own this. Um, and in, in agriculture, monthly cash flow projections are very valuable because of, of the seasonality of our businesses. And where they become valuable sometimes is that you know, there might be Lean time periods. Next slide, James. There might be some lean times throughout the year that you don't recognize because you you put so much money up front to get your crop into the field. Then it, by the time you get there, there might be you might need to recognize, hey, I'm going to need a line of credit or some type of operating loan to get to where I start making money. Um, here's just a simple example of a cash flow. Like I said, the sources of funds at the top: grants, loans, lines of credit. And then your net income before taxes. And then finally, your uses of funds or your you know, loan payments could be your automobile. You invest in your building or put a new building up, infrastructure, things like that. If you buy new land, 
preparation for the land. Well, like I said, that gives you your use of funds and then that, that generates your funds generated. And then that gives you your, and then if you know your beginning cash balance and you can calculate your ending cash balance as a result. Next slide, James. You know, we often recommend, especially for a lot of our ag, for farm clients, really to do that monthly cash flow, especially entering a new enterprise or really gonna get started planning ahead. And it's one thing to worry about is, um, don't get over worried about making sure it's perfect. You know, you can you can get too worried about it. You can have analysis by paralysis if you're concerned. Perfection here is not necessary, but this is just supposed to be a guiding tool. Now, also don't make the mistake that sometimes farmers like to make, and uh, other businesses too, not just farmers, but they like to speak in all round numbers. Well, it's gonna cost me about 5,000 here, 3,000 here, 2,000 here. Well, the round numbers are okay, but let's try to get those. As, we, we don't have to get to the penny, but if, if it's 5,000, is that 5,200 or is that 4,800? That couple hundred, that, that's a big difference. Getting that down as close to the exact number as possible is, is important to get there. Because, you know, as we like to say, garbage in, garbage out. You know, this is only going to be as good a tool for you planning and measuring your business as was effort that you put into it and information you put in. So next slide, James. You know, before you start your monthly cash flow production, you gotta, it's really good to know what your account balance is at the first date of the year or the first, or if your fiscal year is different from your calendar year, the first day of that fiscal year. Um, you wanna know any, if you have any outstanding, you know, invoices or accounts receivable that you're expected to be paid for or people that you owe at the beginning of the year, make sure you're taking account of that because that's gonna affect your cash flow for the next year. Next slide, James. <clears throat> you know, the, there's some simple goals from this monthly cash flow. One is to understand where your money's, where your cash is coming from, what those sources are and, where, and when that money's gonna come through. It's also to understand your uses of funds and when that money's gonna go out. And do they pair up or not? And do that when if one if they're not synchronized, does this create pro in the problems for your business? You really want to identify those lean points of the year. I know when one time when I was managing a cooperative, we were managing a cooperative that was most most part a successful profitable business. But even then, even in its best years, you had to have a line of credit to be able to cover those expenses during those really peak periods of time to keep bills and vendors paid. And then if you do have lean times through the year, if you know you've got a couple of months, is there a way to improve your cash flow? Is there something that you could sell to improve cash flow or is there a way to get a line of credit or operating loan to do that? It also helps you prepare for unexpected instances. If you know you want to have some fluff in there you want to make sure that you know we always recommend that you know you that you're working capital you know that you've got three to six months of working capital available to you whether it's cash in the bank or, or line of credit available to you because guess what there could be something to happen and you and this bills are still going to keep coming in so next slide james um you know to do your source of funds what we, you know, you're, you, you know, you, you want to look at your sales, and you're going to look at it by by product or by market. Either way is a, is a good way to figure it out. And, and you look, you break that down by pencil or, pay, or spreadsheet by month. All right, we're expecting to sell in January. Okay, we're having those sales, but in February we're hoping to sell 50 boxes of this at this price. So it's going to have this number of revenue. And you break this down by the month. It helps if you've got past records to say, you know, in the past we've had this activity and it helps us to do that. Other sources of funds that you want to include is, you know, we're expected to get this loan or we're expected to get this grant. This is what's, these are other sources that are going to happen during these months or time period. Next slide, James. You know, you're going to have detailed cash items for your uses, all your cost of goods, your production expenses, labor, packaging, fertilizer, delivery, those types of things, but also detailed items of your cash operating expenses, whether it be advertising, repair and maintenance, administrative, fee, you know, accounting fees. Yeah, I'm gonna, you know, I, I work with a CPA to file my taxes, always file them in April, well, guess what? 
I'm probably going to have a three, four, five hundred dollar or even higher bill every year on in that month. I want to make sure that I'm ready to pay that, or I might have taxes to pay during that time period. You know, be ready, you know, make sure you've got the cash to absorb that hit when it comes. Next slide, James. Um, also in your cash flow, you're going to have capital expenses. Are you looking to purchase that tractor? Are you going to put up a new shed? Are there any other capital improvements you're going to make? And what time of the year are you going to do that? Um, when are you, do you have monthly payments or do you have annual payments? You know, sometimes you have loan payments that are just due on an annual basis or, or major insurance payments that are due on an you know, annual basis. Make sure you remember when those come through to make sure that you're ready to prepare to pay for those, have the cash to pay those. Next slide, James. Um, again, creating a simple cash flow is you're going to have at the top all your sources of funds, and then you're going to have a uses of funds in the middle section, and you're going to subtract those out to get your net funds generated. And then you're, you know you're going to have your beginning balance at the top, ending balance at the top, and you just transfer the ending balance, the beginning balance to the next column over. Um, as you go through one of those examples, you'll see if there's a, you know if all of a sudden your ending balance is at a negative number or really low. And, oh, okay, we've got a lean time here. We've got to figure out how to make it through those couple of months. You know, because I mean, when we did our budget, we we're going to make money, but we didn't think, you know, if you, if you just do a yearly budget, you might not see that couple of months that, you know, cash could be really short. And it's also valuable because you, if you start a new business and you're thinking, okay, you know, you think, you think man, man thanks, this is really tough. This is really lean. I wasn't expecting, you know, you, you get depressed, but you could know, hey, we did our projection. We knew it was going to be lean during this time we're fine, we're on track. Or if you were not expecting this to be a lean month and all of a sudden it is a lean month, what's happened? What's changed? How do I need to pivot to address this problem? Next slide, James. Yeah, Brent, I just wanted to add that that's extremely uh, another good reason to not just get married to one financial statement and look at it only. Because um, like you mentioned, the cash flow statement may tell you something completely different than what your income statement's telling you, but one can kind of help to reaffirm the other. Like if you're having a lean month, it's not necessarily, you know, the dynamics of the market have changed and I have to go out of business. It's just, this could be a lean time of the year that comes every year. And, Oh, I look back over last year and this happened as well. And like you said, then you can consult your income statement and say, well, I'm still profitable in the end. So I just have to figure out a way to either get an operating loan or to, you know, get through this lean time and plan for it next year. Okay. Yeah, thanks, James. That, that helped. Thank you. Going to the next slide. Um, you know, and if you have a predicted lean time, are there expenses that can wait until later? Um, generally speaking, we always make sure keep your insurance current. Don't ever, never lose your insurance because that's such a huge liability problem. But you know, if, if you're thinking about being late on your loan payment, talk to your banker first. You know, th they might be able to say, "Yeah, we can extend you some credit here. You're fine." Or you know if you're if your seed representative or your chemical representative, they might be able to extend that line of credit. But the key thing is talk to those to those people that you've got you know that that you owe money to, so they understand what's going on. Don't just disappear on people. The worst thing to do is just to disappear. You know. So and then also looking at are there lines of credit? Are there operating expenses? Is there a way to get some investment into your business? Is it an option? There's lots of strategies and sometimes you know just calling k card or calling somebody or another trusted resource to say hey i'm having this time can you give me some advice or what are some other things there might be another farmer or business owner in your area that you trust that y'all can share notes on or it might be k card talk to somebody don't just silo yourself and, and hunker yourself down when you're having a problem is that that generally leads to more problem so Um, the, the last tool is the financial statement we're going to cover is the balance sheet. Like I said, it really is kind of measures your financial health of your business at any point of time. The balance sheet kind of tells us a few things about your business. It tells you what you own, what are your assets, um, your current assets is how much cash do you have in the bank, how much inventory do you have on hand, um, if you have any accounts receivable, what, what's that? And then you have fixed that and you have other assets. If you're a cattle farmer, you know, obviously, you know, your cows in many ways are, you know, your you know, calves aren't necessarily assets, but your cows because they're going to keep producing sellable items where you can be listed as an asset. Um, your land, 
um, your buildings, your equipment, or your fixed assets. And that really helps you what those are. And it also needs to show how much depreciation you've done, how much you've accumulated over the years to show what, you know, what the value of that is. Um, it also needs to show what you owe from a, your liabilities. You know, from a current perspective is, do I have any credit card debt? Do I have a line of credit out? What's my current portion of any loan payments is due this year that, uh, that I need to pay? Long term is what's my long term over a year debt? What's my long term loans? Do I have any? You know, what are those debt looks looks like? And then when you subtract the difference between the assets and the liabilities, gives you your net worth for the equity that you have in that business. Um, and so that kind of tells you, okay, my business, the value of my business is worth X dollars because my assets are that much greater than my liabilities. Um, everything on a, and it's called a balance sheet because every because it has to balance the assets has to equal liabilities plus equity. If the if it's not balancing, if it's way off, then there's something. Then there's there's been it's been, it's been put together incorrectly, and you need to make sure that the balance sheet does balance, um, which can be painfully at times because we joke at K Card about how much fun it can be to balance balance sheets. But it, it does need to balance because it, it's telling you there's something wrong in your financial records that you not that that's not matching up correctly. Next slide, James. You know, in a balance sheet, it often looks like you have assets on your from an accounting perspective. You have your assets on the left, like you have your current assets at the top, other assets in the middle, fixed assets at the bottom, and then you have your liabilities current at the top and your long-term liabilities, and then your list of equity there at the bottom right. And then like I said, the left column should equal the right column. So, next slide. Oh, I forgot we had all those. Forgot we had animations, I'm sorry, James. Um, real quickly, I'll talk about, there's ways to, to do some analysis of these different statements, and then we're gonna go through an example or two. Um, you know, your income statement can be used to kind of measure your profitability you know, there's different ways that you want to use to, to not just look at the numbers, but then you want to dig deeper in those numbers to figure out what's my, you know, a gross margin is often your total, your gross profit, which is your total sales minus COGS divided by total sales. And that gross margin is a really good way of measuring how profitable I am from the sale of my goods, you know, to cover my cost. And, it's, and it also helps, it's a common benchmark in many different businesses. So you can look to see, you know, Okay, this retail store, their benchmark, their gross margin is this. What you know, I'm a retail store selling food. What is my gross margin? Am I comparing well or favorably with them? Profit margin, your net profit before tax divided by total sales. That lets you know hey, from every dollar in sales I'm generating, I'm taking home X dollars as profit. And that's really, it's a really useful tool. Next slide, James. Um, also, from your income statement analysis, a way is to measure your operational efficiency. One of the, you know, we've got we got several here listed, but we know one of them that I think is really important to look at, especially in agriculture or any business that has quite a bit of labor, is my labor to sales and measure what's my total payroll expenses, not just what I'm paying, but not just wages, but also. You know, a forgotten expense sometimes in doing projections is that payroll tax and those payroll expenses. And it can come, you know, but what's my total payroll expenses divided by total sales? That really lets me know, okay, for every dollar I'm generating in sales, it's costing me X dollars. And how does this compare with other people in this industry or where I thought it, where I think it needs to be? It, or I was expecting our labor to sales to be 15% and it's 20%, okay? What's going on? Is it truly need to be 20% for you to be efficient? Or do you have some guys slacking out in the field and you didn't realize it? Or is there too much dead time and you're not realizing? And so that's why these tools are very valuable. And coming up with these different analytical tools really gives you another dashboard of things to, receive, to identify problems before the end of the year, before the season's over. Um, inventory, you know, if you're, if you're running a retail business, inventory turnover is a really good one to get it lets you know how many times something on the shelf is moving throughout the year. You know, and you can compare, and that's a very common number in a lot of retail businesses. All right, next slide, James. And from the balance sheet, there's, you know, 
liquidity is kind of measures your ability to pay your bills when they come due. Um, one's called the current ratio that measure that, which is current assets divided by current liabilities. And you want to have your target to be greater than two. And it's, when it's greater than two, that, that lets you know that your business or farm will all, is in a good position to be able to pay any bills that are due without any harm to your business. And then you've got working capital, which is the current assets minus current liabilities and other ones. But you know, some type of liquidity measure is very valuable for your business. Next one, James. Um, solvency is about, you can use your balance sheet to analyze your ability to pay all your debts. If you can't pay all your debts, if all of a sudden you went out of business and sold all your assets and you can't cover all your debts, you're technically upside down and insolvent. You know, so, you know, a, a great way to measure that is your, called debt to asset ratio, which is your total liabilities divided by total assets. Um, we have here warning greater than 50%. Um, in reality, that, that means debtors owe more than 50% of your business. The real warning light is when it gets over 80%. 80 to 85% is when it's a major red warning. You, you want it to be under 50%, but you know, when it, when it, when it, especially when it gets over 80, 90%, that's when red lights need to be flashing that you're moving in the wrong direction. You know, because lots of startups are going to have 75, 80% debt. That's just the nature of some startup businesses. All right, next slide, James. Okay. Um, we're going to next go through a, a, a simple example of kind of um, how to put together an income statement and a cash, a monthly cash flow to show how, the ease of putting one together and then B to, to illustrate why you need both statements and why, you know, and help to, why the monthly cash flow is good in, in addition to that um, um, income statement. Brent, is this the, the Excel file, the financial statement example? Yeah, pull out that, pull out that Excel file and I'll read out the different transactions. Ooh, that's what I was just saying. That'll work. Okay. All right. Can we, all right. So the first trend, and I'm going to read these transactions and I'll help James fill it out. The first is I sold this. Um, it's a cabbage farmer and he has the following transactions during the year. One, sold 40,000 pounds of cabbage in June for 30 cents a pound. Um, and then, so, yeah, 40,000 times 30. And then, actually, James, we want that in the sales income line, not the income one. So, sorry about that. And then the second trend, and then also he sold 50,000 pounds of cabbage in Ju July for at 25 cents a pound. So, good. Um, next was $1,500 for cabbage plants in March. All right, he paid $500 for chemicals in April. We'll fill out the income statement and then we'll fill out the, in the monthly cash flow we'll compare. So, um, then there was $500 for production supplies. And then he, had, he paid $500 for fertilizer in February, April, and May. So it's $1,500 total for fertilizer. Um, he had labor expenses of $1,000 in March, $500 in April, $500 in May, $2,000 in June, and $3,000 in July. That's seven thousand dollars total. So, okay, and then we had a website cost of fifty dollars a month for six hundred dollars. Um, product liability insurance policy in February that totaled seven hundred and fifty dollars. Um, gap audit fee of seven fifty in January. Um, utility cost of sixty dollars a month, so that's seven twenty. Um, pay a distributor a thousand dollars in June and fifteen hundred dollars in July for distribution, so it'd be twenty five hundred. Pay an accountant four four hundred and fifty dollars in April to file taxes. Pay a depreciation that'd be a professional fee. Yeah, good. How much was that again? Four fifty. Um, 
a depreciation expense of $1,000 for equipment that he already previously owned. And then the monthly loan payment of $300, which was 50% was principal. So 150 times 12 would be your interest expense. So from this, we see we have total sales income of 24,500, a gross profit of 13.5, and then net income of $4,930. So pretty profitable operation, looks good. So now let's look at the monthly cash flow. All right, going back, um, James in June, 40,000 pounds at 30 cents for the sales. In June, up, in June, up here at the top, cabbage sales. You're in the wrong spot. It's okay. Good. Good. And in July, 50,000 pounds at 25 cents a pound. Okay, in March, he had plant, um, he paid $1,500 for plants. Put James on the spot with this. So um, $500 for chemicals in April. Um, fertilizer, um, $500 for production supplies in March. I see supplies up there below C. There we go. Okay, and then um, $500 for fertilizer in February, April, and May. Um, labor expenses, he had $1,000 in March. Five hundred in April, five hundred in May, two thousand in June, and three thousand in July. Um, website cost he had fifty dollars each month. Um, liability insurance policy in February seven fifty. So insurance seven fifty in February. The gap audit fee was seven fifty in January. Um, utility cost was sixty dollars a month. And James, I forgot to create it. We forgot to create a line for that. I forgot a line for that. Sorry about that. I called myself testing it this morning, but I guess I didn't. So. Um, a distributor, a thousand dollars in June and fifteen hundred in July, and in a month, um, in a month, um, accountant four hundred fifty in April, um, depreciation expense obviously doesn't get recorded on the cash flow, and a monthly payment of three hundred dollars for his loan payment. And then his beginning cash balance was $3,500. Okay. There you go, it'll work. So if you look, we know that the business is profitable from the income statement, but if you look in, in the months of April and May, his ending cash balance is negative of by, by May is a negative cash balance of $6,500. So obviously the spring months are gonna be a lean cash period time for the business. So going into the year, the cabbage farmer needs to figure out, is there a way that I can have a line of credit so I don't have to necessarily pay for my different expenses for A, to, have to, to cover this with the bank, or do I need the line of credit with my different, you know, with my seed, you know, company where I'm buying the chemicals and seed and fertilizer and stuff like that. So. That's the, you know, you know, thanks James for making that bigger, it helps a lot.
but you know this this is a simple illustrative tool to kind of help you how easy it is to put together a monthly cash flow but also help you understand why you need the monthly cash flow versus your income statement so i hope this helped everybody so okay you know and then one thing to think about we, we've kind of covered all these financial statements and everything that you know your profit loss or your income statement your balance sheet and your cash flow and those are really valuable to help you understand where your business that you want it to go and where it's been and now you know you know if you're thinking about funding assistance for either a grant or a loan a, you need to figure out what are your goals. And I think we talked about that probably last week in the business plan because I know whenever I do a business plan K card, the first thing I ask is, what are your goals? Where do you want to be? But then figuring out your these financials and understanding your financials can help you understand what are your financial resources that you need to achieve your goals. Um, do you need land expenses? Do you need more land to achieve that goal of yours? Do you need how much? And if if so, how much is that going to cost? you need improvements in your facilities do you need new buildings or new infrastructure do you need equipment you know do you need a tractor do you need a tomato a wash line for your vegetables do you need a new saw for your meat processing plant you know is there equipment that you need to help you with your business um you have enough operating money or cash to operate that business to grow because i know you know i was talking to a client this year who's business is doing really well he's direct marketing beef and guess what you know a pandemic has been a great year to be in meat sales well guess what he was growing faster than he projected it to be well guess what if all of a sudden you're having to buy in a few extra calves and you weren't expecting and you're also feeding more calves than you expect guess what his cost went up his monthly cash flow guess what for the first time you know he was having to borrow money on a line of credit that he hadn't had to do in the past because his business was growing because he needed that operating capital to achieve that final goal you know he's still online he's still profitable but you know and it, it made him nervous at first because brent i've never had to do this before i said well let's, we went through the numbers i went i can see now why you're doing it because you're growing at much at a much faster pace than you expected so when you, when you have growth or expect to grow what is that cash needed to really grow what type of labor do you need? What type of personnel do you need? You know, I hope that, you know, you're not going, so I can do it all myself or I can, well, that's not the right answer normally. You know, you need to figure out what personnel you have to grow your business. Um, what expertise do you need? Is there more information you need to achieve those goals? But really thinking about those resources that you need and goals, you the things that you need to grow your business, to achieve those goals and your financials, your past financials is going to help you figure out, oh, this is where we're at. Your projection can figure out, help you figure out what you need for those things. Um, another thing to be thinking about is when you're talking about achieving those goals and, and, and having to access funding for it, be thinking, are we talking about grants or loans? You know, um, and perfectly honest, if the answer is always grants, then that might not be as likely because as you, I'll, this is more James Bailey with the mind, but there's not always a grant for everything. And, a, and, a, and, a, and one thing that I always tell people is, if this doesn't necessarily cash flow or be profitable um, without a grant, then is it really a good investment for somebody to invest in? Now, maybe that grant helps you get over the hump to where you're really rolling and profitable, but if it's never profitable without a grant, then is it really an enterprise you need to be enter, entering in? So, but uh, which are you talking about? Because you know, guess what? There's some. There's not a lot of grants out there to buy land. No. Um, and then there's some grants that are good for working capital, and some grants will help you with capital work equipment. But you know, you have to understand what your true need is, and if you're talking about a loan or a grant, and understanding that really helps helps you go through that tool. And I think James has pulled up this worksheet I'm kind of reading through, which is really good. To, as you're thinking about your business, be going through these steps to figure out. Where am I here? Where am I here? And then finally, when you have an idea of what you're talking about, you can then together put together what we call a project budget. You know, and, and depending on the grant, it, it, it might have to get really defined, but it's always good to start out with back of the envelope numbers of 
you know, this is my funding is needed for personnel or my funding is needed for equipment. You know, if it's for equipment, I think, I, I think I'm going to need um, X, Y, Gidget and BC Gadget, and they're going to cost me around $10,000, $15,000. So I know I need $25,000. Now, then you, then you go to the vendor and you, then you go talk to people and you realize, yep, that, I'm just right. This is exactly what I need. But now I'll, as I was looking, I might need this too. But when I talk to the equipment rep, it might be eight eight thousand five hundred, sixteen thousand five hundred. So my costs have, have become more narrow; they're more defined. You know, when you're when you're applying for grants, you want to make sure that you can justify that project budget. You know, they're going to ask you to, to justify if it's personnel. If you're asking for working capital for personnel, all right. Well, what employees are you going to have? What is the wages you're going to pay them and how many hours do you expect to pay them? If it's for equipment or if it's for a building, you know, have you truly talked to the equipment provider to get um, invoices or quotes on those pieces of equipment? Have you talked to a contractor to figure out how much it's going to cost to put up this 10,000 square foot building that you want? What's the cooling cost? What are the, what's the electrician bill going to be? But really thinking about that, you know, you can start out that 30,000 square put level on your budget and then just slowly narrow it down. And the great thing is um, KCAR, especially James, is we're here to help you define that and help you figure out, here's my goals. This is what I think I need money for. Now, it's, if, you've got, if you've got your goals and you know what you need your money, what you need funding for, it makes our job helping you a lot easier because then we can say, all right, you fit in this pool here or you fit in this pool. If you just call us and say, hey, I want a grant. Well, you know, is there a grant for that? Well, you don't, it's harder for us. We'll still try to help you, but it's not as easy for us to help you as it is in that case. Um, I'm pretty sure I've rambled on long enough, James. So is, are there any questions? do you have any questions or any other questions out there? Yeah, sending questions now and I'll kind of just add on what Brent said and then as specific as you can get about the need, that's just all the more I can help to find something kind of more tailored to you. And, and also I'll just echo what I said earlier and he just mentioned again, which is if it doesn't cash flow, if you have a project related to a grant or if you have an asset you're looking to buy like a tractor, that over the long term, over the life of that tractor, it just doesn't actually show that it helps your operation that much, you know, with once you factor in things like, you know, perhaps the extra liability insurance, the diesel fuel, the uh, labor that's going to go into repair if you do it yourself or the maintenance cost if you're going to allow someone else to do it, which any farmer will tell you is always more than even they would have budgeted for uh, on an annual basis. Um, pieces to, to, you know, hay balers and things like that. Um, and, and also just, uh, to, to go back to a slide that we had on the income statement analysis, like Brent said, if you're going to be asking for uh, personnel, you want to be able to justify that. A great way to justify it is if you've got these records, Brent and I can help you throw together a quick uh, labor to sales ratio. And that would really blow most grantors out of the water. Like if you were to be able to say, I'm in touch enough with my business that I know this specific metric and this is what you're going to judge me on because I'm asking for you to invest more in it. If I can show you that I've got a good return on that, you know, that it's not just one to one and I'm paying as much in payroll expenses I'm getting in total sales. But if I can show you that it's a low number that I'm paying, you know, 20 cents for every dollar of my sales, and that's not terrible. Um, but if I can project that out and show, you know, if you all can, can help me scale up my labor, I can make that number lower and thus, you know, increase my sales and decrease that, uh, that payroll expense per that dollar of sales. So just understanding kind of how you can utilize these financial statements to make better decisions, but also to help explain your business to potential, you know, lenders, investors, grantors, um, and just so you yourself know it and have a, a more intimate understanding of kind of how cash moves through it and how that impacts you in the end, you know, how that impacts you when you're sitting at the dinner table stressed out about whether you're going to be able to, you know, pay the electric bill next month. That's kind of the goal that, that we hope to work with you on is to not have those, uh, those times to help you find instruments and tools to get through those times and to find, you know, uh, grants or, or loans to, to help you grow your business to get to a place where it's sustainable. And that's another point Brent mentioned, which is 
you shouldn't necessarily get a grant if it if you have a project that just kind of is there and then it's gone afterwards like you're doing it during the grant period and then it's gone that's what really grantors hate to see they would like to see an investment in the business that takes you from here to here and you stay here or even go up afterwards it helps you kind of ramp up and jump up to that point it provides the boost the shot in the arm you need to to get to that next level and, and maintain that higher um, higher level of revenue or, or income. Uh, and with that, I'll kind of also drop a teaser before we start Q&A here. We've got a few questions. I'll start a teaser for next week. Um, we will have the state funding program. So we'll have the Governor's Office of Ag Policy. We'll have uh, our Kentucky State University uh, grant program on here to discuss kind of the funding programs that are, that are available specifically within the state. Uh, the week after that will be the federal funding program, uh, programs which will have all of our partners from USDA um, at the state offices join us uh, to discuss kind of the funding that's available out there. And I know that's probably why most people registered, but this, these first several sessions are extremely important to help you get to the point where you can successfully apply and receive you know, one of these grants. Because we understand you didn't get into farming to apply for grants. And to be honest, I'm not here to just help you apply for grants. I wanna help you receive the grants. My goal isn't to help you cross the finish line and submit an application. My goal is to get that application funded. So that's why, um, as Brent mentioned, in our conversations, we'll get really in depth with you and we'll ask questions you know, that, that will probe your business a little bit. And we're not doing that to judge, we're doing that to uncover and to help uh, and to be able to present it in a more you know, favorable way to potential grantors or lenders. So Brent, in our Q&A, we've got a question. Uh, let's see, farmer says, I don't wanna sound negative, uh, but when you discuss grants, I have a general question. Since I'm the owner and only employee, if the farm should fail due to weather or health uh, and I have an active grant, um, does it incur like an end of business liability? How does that pass along uh, to, you know, the, the executor of this state or, or just how does that go along? Do you incur a debt essentially for having that grant? Um, and in most cases, Brent, and you can answer if, if you've got some more experience with this, in most cases, the answer is no. Like with federal grants um, that, if it's on a cost share basis, the grant would just kind of stop and the funding would be rescinded from there unless you had a continuity plan, which is something we also would love to discuss with you to help, you know, if there's a local farmer in your area who you work with who, you know, in the case of, of a, a death or, you know, and not a, a tragic one, but just a plan as you're getting older to transition, you know, the, a farm or a business into the next generation of its, of its growth. Um, we, we do quite a bit of that. Um, and it's certainly needed and necessary as we hate to see, you know, these single owner, employee owner businesses just go away because um, they're such a pleasure and they bring so much to our local economies. Uh, um, James, you're right. Most grants would not become expensive now. It depends on the grant. Some do have a, if a death is different, but some do have a, we'll put a stipulation that you stay in business for at least X number of years. And if you don't stay in business X number of years, it can be transferred into a loan. Um, but in most cases, if you can sell the business or if there was a death, there's outstanding events like that or, or, or a disability, the grant, the grantor would, would, would just, it would not become a debt or an expense. But yeah, it, it, it so much depends on the grant. So, And a good example of that would be kind of with one of the popular programs is uh, EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentive Programs through the Natural Resources and Conservation Service under USDA. A lot of people know them as the High Tunnel Program. Uh, they have a High Tunnel Initiative. You can receive, um, you know, a grant for uh, a High Tunnel and you have to keep that High Tunnel, I believe it's like three years um, before anything can happen to it. Like before you could sell it, before you would go out of business um, or that would revert I believe to some type of, of debt or they would, you know, have to seize the asset back um, as collateral, but just an example there. But as Brent mentioned, it really varies by the grant and the grantor, even under USDA within, 
you know, the ag marketing service uh, versus the natural resource conservation service, all those different agencies under USDA have uh, kind of different dispositions towards how they uh, view the terms and conditions of, of the grants they award. So um, I, I know who that was. If you want to email me, we can certainly have a discussion about that um, and, and what funding best fits you because I also see you're looking for a a $100,000 pecan harvester. So that's exciting and neat to grow your business. And that's why you were asking, you know, if you're successful getting that, obviously you don't want to, to burden the estate or yourself if something were to happen. And that's, that's what we're here to help you with is to help you kind of mitigate that risk in the decision-making process up front to say like, okay, you know, this harvester is gonna allow you to make how much money over what you currently make. And that's when we say, does it cash flow? That's kind of what we mean. Does it show that it can produce, you know, a, a significant net positive outcome for you that makes it worth, you know, perhaps the risk of applying for that grant and incurring that liability, even though it isn't a liability yet. Let's see. All right. And then I had a few questions pop up um, on different slides uh, asking if we would share certain things. All of the things we've shared today, the handouts and slides will be available uh, on the website that was sent out an email yesterday, the URL, and it should also be shared um, like when you close Zoom, that URL should have opened for that K card site. If it is not on there, it should be on there. Um, let's see, by close of business tomorrow, um, we'll have all those uploaded. And if for some reason you have a specific question regarding those, please feel free to to shoot me an email at jbarrett, J-B-A-R-R-E-T-T -T, at kcard.info. Um, and I'd be happy to, to send that your way or to answer any questions you may have about those specific handouts. Cause I know we move through those quickly. And as you all saw, e even, even when Brent and I are coordinating here, I can still accidentally enter data in the wrong cell and he has to say, no James here. <laughs> and that's why we always reconcile these statements is because I fat finger some things and I need someone to look over my shoulder and say, oh, you put that there, but that could really throw off, you know, when you go to buy fertilizer next year, if you accidentally put that $1,500 fertilizer expense under chemicals instead, you know, you, you haven't budgeted for it appropriately then because you had misclassified it to begin with just because of a small error like that. So. Uh, it doesn't look like there are any more questions, Brent. I want to thank you for joining me today um, and sharing this information about uh, the importance of financials and kind of walking us through the financial statements. Um, we sure hope that all of you join us next week again for the state funding programs and uh, the federal funding programs to follow up the week after that. And then finally closing out on the 5th of November with kind of the process of writing a grant and uh, choosing a project. But as you can certainly see, financials play a very important role in uh, kind of the feasibility of that project and defining that project's need. And that's why we discussed that today. All right. Thanks, James. No problem. You all have a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, and if you're joining us in the future and, and you're seeing this on our website, please again, shoot us an email at kcard at kcard.info. If you have any questions, um, we'd be happy to, to reach out and discuss, uh, even if this video is several months or years old. Thank you. Bye-bye.